uh, I had the, the great uh, uh, privilege and uh, good fortune of being exposed to Simula 67, which, uh, well, because after 67, I'm not that old, but uh, still Simula was kind of, uh, was the, was still the dominant uh, view of object-oriented programming at that time, which very, very few people had encountered. So the Simula was the first object-oriented language. And, uh, well, I, it was quite uh, confidential, so uh, kind of best kept uh, secret for many years, but I, I got introduced to it and I immediately knew that it was the, the right way to program, it was pretty obvious, uh, at least to, to me. And so for a number of years I worked with Simula, but both uh, in, on paper, I mean, for, uh, to help my research work and, and to build systems. Uh, Burton was uh, teaching at UCSB and, uh, well, of course he had already in France started some projects, so um, his ideas, he came already with, with some uh, ideas and project to UCSB and uh, he continued and he, sh he shared that with his students and and suddenly one night he comes back home and says well I have a student from Japan who is excited about my ideas and uh, he wants to talk to his company about it. Oh, I said okay well I, there was a a new idea, why not? <laughs> but I didn't really believe in it. But several months later, Burton <laughs> came home and said, well, the company is interested in my ideas and they are ready to start to, to help us start a company. So there it was. And uh, that was the beginning of the second adventure. The first adventure was the move to the US with five children. Uh, I found myself in 85 in Santa Barbara with a newly created company uh, a, building a uh, system which, uh, which was called uh, Architects and which was a very smart uh, editor on, on initially with funding from a Japanese uh, uh, company and uh, well I was looking for a tool to build it. Uh, to, to, to build a system. And while well, Simula was kind of uh, fading out at that time, I looked at C++, which was there. I opened the book, I closed it uh, pretty quickly afterwards. There was Objective-C, there was small talk. These were all interesting developments, but uh, they didn't really correspond to the kind of strict software engineering standards that we, uh, that my colleagues and I had learned to, 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 to observe. So we developed our own uh, language, which was based on, well, the stories uh, would the full story, of course, would be longer, but I had written a book which I never finished, but which had a very precise notation for expressing uh, algorithms uh, at the time, so I used that. I used my work on formal specification. I co-wrote the first paper on the Z uh, uh, specification language, so my work on Z and also a successor to Z, which was called M, was also very influential, so I kind of, you know, over half a day, I, I kind of uh, put all this together and we implemented a, a pre-process Processor to, to well, we sort of it, I think, right from the start as a compiler to generate C, but it was really just for internal purposes. And then what happened is that we went to Uppsala, the first Uppsala in 86, where the company had a booth, uh, a rather makeshift uh, booth. We didn't have that much money, uh, uh, but then we, we showed that uh, we were actually showing the, the other tool, but people were interested in Eiffel. Well, at Uppsala, uh, Burton had some tutorials, and uh, and that was the, the first uh, place where Eiffel was really uh, exhibited. And from then on, it was clear that the focus of the company was more on was on that technology, on the tools uh, to help programmers. Um, make the most of the power of object-oriented technology. We realized that contrary to what I thought, uh, what I had thought, uh, uh, no one else had anything uh, similar because everyone else was going into these uh, kind of AI-oriented developments, experimental programming, no, no typing, uh, no, no idea, of course, of generosity because without typing, uh, um, there's no need for that, or all the kind of C++ direction, which is, of course, also respectable, but which to, to us was was 
quite uh, was, was a diversion you know, or a transition to, to help people move to the object-oriented world, but it uh, didn't seem like uh, an end in, in, in itself. Uh, and I'm not saying this to deprecate C++, because obviously it's been a very successful uh, uh, technology, but to, to uh, still think that it's best viewed as a transition technology. So we realized that there was nothing like it, and uh, when we came back f from uh, from from uh, uh, from uh, Oopsla, we started kind of refocusing the company on it. And there's also something very important which happened at that time, which is that people who started playing with the language, even with a very primitive implementation we had at the time, started telling us, you know, there's something absolutely new, which I've never seen before. It's how easily you can change your mind. And, and, and I would say today this is still one of the major uh, assets uh, of Eiffel is the flexibility, to, to use the technical term, the extendability. So the people don't necessarily uh, believe us when we say this because it's like a hand waving and to a certain extent everyone say, uh, says, I mean, people talk about flexibility. But this is perhaps one of the, well, it's one of the major differences be, uh, between Eiffel and, uh, and, and other technologies is how easily you can have a first design, a clean design. I'm not talking about uh, you know agile style, uh, hack it and uh, and and see uh, see if it works. It, it really, a, a good design, which, however, is not perfect. You realize that it's not perfect. You change it, and you don't uh, spend your entire life paying for the uh, sins of your use, so 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 to speak. And and it's not one single aspect. It's not one single feature of of, of Eiffel. It's a collection of things. It's contracts. It's the modularity mechanism. The information hiding uh, mechanisms, it's the principle of uniform access, the, something that uh, other language, that similar actually had got right, but that uh, later languages uh, didn't, the idea that you don't distinguish from the outside between uh, accessing a piece of data and calling a function, which e even UML, which should be high level, didn't quite get right. So that's, it, it's, it's a whole set of uh, seemingly small uh, properties that together uh, make a g g give a framework in which you can change your uh, uh, designs and get new uh, integrate new ideas very easily and very quickly without suffering too much. So this is what people started telling us right from the start, and which really encouraged us to to uh, to to build the company and the technology uh, around Eiffel. To characterize the typical uh, Eiffel user, well, this is someone who typically has a difficult application. Uh, so uh, an application uh, often for which uh, he or she has tried uh, something else before, maybe uh, a couple other technologies and failed, you, you know, hit limits of complexity or limits of reliability and then doesn't have a choice and he wants it really to succeed. He, and uh, so it, it can be in the financial industry where some of our biggest uh, customer applications are, can be in the aerospace industry which is also another uh, strong uh, area for, for us, it can be in healthcare, sometimes also of course in education which is the kind of a different kind of application, of course, uh, but it's, it's people who just cannot afford the stuff to fail. Uh, so that's one, character, uh, one characteristic, it's that the uh, reliability and quality uh, requirements are typically very high, uh, often with continuous operation uh, for, you know, uh, systems managing uh, 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 trade floor, this kind of thing. Uh, a, a second uh, characteristic is that these applications often need to undergo much change uh, over their uh, life cycle, which may be years or uh, decades, uh, and, and here the extendability mechanisms of IFO really uh, shine. One of the key uh, distinctive features of IFO is that it's, it's a life cycle approach. So it's not just for programming, not only is it not just a language, but also it's not even as a language, it's not just for programming, it's for analysis, it's for design, it's for implementation, it's, it's for maintenance, for testing, and so on. So it's really this is kind of uh, holistic, to, to use a pretentious term, a view of software development. And so, you know, this is kind of really still going against the grain of, uh, of, of the software engineering culture today. Most people think they need some kind of high-level uh, requirements tool, uh, some case tool to do analysis and design, and then a clear 
scripts or something or a visual studio to do implementation and then JUnit or something like that to, to do testing. And what we do is that we integrate everything, which means that for, for the developer, you don't have this need to, to, um, to switch between Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde all, 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 all the time, to, to, to switch personalities, to, to switch gears, context, and so on. You stay in the same conceptual framework. And the basic ideas of IFO, which are you know, classes, inheritance, single and multiple, multiple inheritances are important. And of course, as you pointed out, uh, contracts, the use of uh, uh, formal, precise specification elements uh, uh, is in association with every piece of software. Th these ideas, and, and a few more, these ideas apply throughout the life cycle, through, throughout the, uh, the process, from the highest, more, most uh, abstract levels of uh, thinking about the system, all the way down to the nuts and bolts, the nitty gritty of software, construction, debugging, testing, and so on. Although debugging, I should say, we, uh, we, we try to have less debugging with IFO, but, uh, well, as uh, you wouldn't be believe me if I told you uh, that uh, no debugging at all uh, remains, and in fact, uh, there's a quite powerful debugger in the environment.